Ladies and gentlemen, Anna Quinlan! Okay, so now you have been writing for the Times for like 10 years. And how, how self-conscious are you about what the ideas you're putting out there and how much feedback are you getting from people? It was such a, a flyer that it took me a long time to catch up with what was really happening. I mean, it was really simple. I was the deputy metro editor of the paper. I, I got that job when I was six months pregnant with Quinn. I had it for three months. I took six months off after Quinn was born. I came back. I was pregnant again almost immediately. And I realized I was going to have two little boys. Well, I said to the executive editor, I'm pregnant. And he said, you did that last year. Yeah. <laughs> But I realized I was going to have two little boys under the age of two. And, you know, it wasn't a question of finding good child care or, or anything of the sort. I just felt like there was going to be a lot of cool stuff going on at home, albeit with lots of scut work surrounding it. I'm the oldest of five, so I have no delusions about what child rearing is like. And that I did not want to be in the newsroom um, 10 hours a day. I was going to go home, so I quit. And, People went um, berserk. Right? No, I mean, wasn't there sort of an well, outrage yeah, that, like, hey, pretty, man? Well, it was, uh, uh, there was a lot of, you were supposed to be the woman. You right. were supposed to be deputy metro editor, then metro editor, then, then the sky's the limit, you know, and what are you doing? And about three months later, Abe Rosenthal, who was the executive editor, I, was talking to me. I brought the baby into the office, and I was talking about, you know, maybe doing something every once in a while. And he said, well, why don't you do a once a week column about what you and your friends are talking about on the telephone? And, <laughs> and what I always say is, if you told any male columnist to write a column based on what he and his friends were talking about on the phone, that'd last, what, two, three weeks. Um, and Frankly, I think we both thought, okay, Anna can keep her hand in for a year or two until she gets over all this baby stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this will help bring her back into the fold when she's done, and nobody's really going to read it. I mean, who cares, right? You know, it's not like it was about, you know, the Balkans right. or, or welfare policy. Which people are chomping at the bit to read more um, about. And so I started doing it once a week in the living section. And I think the third column was about um, Mother's Day and about seeing mothers and daughters together and how punishing that was for me. And the, I mean, the volume of mail was just breathtaking. I mean, this was, there was no email, so it was all snail mail, it was all letters. And, oh my God, I don't, I, we lost count at a certain point. And I thought, oh my God, somebody's reading this. And little by little, we started to realize that there was a whole audience out there who had felt as though the New York Times ignored them. And because perhaps the New York Times did. had. And, um, <laughs> and, and that I had somehow become their. Lego, toilet training, flannel nightgown, standard bearer. And, you know, it wasn't intimidating, and I didn't feel a sense of responsibility. I felt this great sense of relief because I was one of them. I was home mm -hmm. alone with these two little boys who were absolutely fabulous and then would, like, put mustard in their hair, um, who, if I went to the bathroom, would give me like 90 seconds to start, you yeah. know, urinating, and then would start pounding on the door, right. you know. I, you know, I, I, would, I would read a book, I would get into bed with a book, I would read three sentences and pass out with a book yeah. on my chest. So the sense that there was this entire community out there of women like me, and that we were having this conversation without me actually seeing them, made me feel like I wasn't alone, too. And it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So other than that one column, can you think of other columns that just brought on a wave of <laughs> response? Yeah, I can think of the main one that did. Um, I, so so the, first the first year was about the boys, and the second year was, you know, and, and I also wrote about political stuff, but from a very personal point of view, and feminism, and, and um, then the third year, I was doing the column, I was pregnant with Maria. And um, I wrote a column when I was 
four or five months pregnant about the fact that I wasn't having amniocentesis, even though I was 36. Mm -hmm. That my doctor had said I should do it. I had told him that there was some risk of miscarriage associated with it, and we weren't going to terminate no matter what, so there was no point in having the test. Mm -hmm. And people went nuclear. Um, it was the first time that I wrote a column where a significant portion of the audience was furious at me, really furious. There were so many letters that the New York Times ran an entire page of letters in the living section. Um, and I, I would say they ran probably uh, four to one negative. Yeah, uh, um, and so did it make you want to crawl in a hole or did it make, I mean, what was your, how did it feel? I mean, I wrote a column once about this friend of mine who adopted two kids and it turned out to be this really incredible thing all the way around. And I, and, I, and I never had any sense that I was walking into it. And boy, oh boy, did I walk into it. I mean, I had so many people write me and say, hey, I'm adopted, and, and, and it's not a rosy picture. Or I gave up my child for adoption. It's not a rosy picture. And I felt like, oh my god, maybe I never want to say anything controversial again for about 24 hours. <laughs> and then I felt like, oh, that's all right. I just told one person's story. I just said that for yeah. one person, it was good. Yeah. Well, I and think you the just problem said for was, one person, the right decision for us, no amnio. Yeah, the problem was that the one person was someone who all the readers thought they really knew. I mean, I, uh -huh. I remember one of the uh -huh. letters was, the Anna Quinlan I knew would never have done this. And I stomped around the house saying, she doesn't know me, she's never met me, and my husband went, okay, wait, you've invited these people into our house once a week for the last two and a half years. You cannot complain right. if they feel like they have a seat at the table. Right. But, you know, I, I never, I mean, I felt yeah. I, that was what we were doing. I actually didn't have that profound a reaction then, although the number of letters I got from people saying, I have a, a disabled sibling, and they sucked up all the attention in our house and I got none and you already have two sons and that's something that you didn't think about enough. Those were really humbling. What was really humbling was the requisite three months go by, four months. I write my last life in the 30s column which begins with the sentence, her name is Maria, um, about the fact that I'm quitting the column because I now have three kids under the age of five and you know I barely have had a coherent thought and um, and then I start to get the letters from people who say I didn't have the amnio either and here is a picture of our little boy who has Down syndrome or I didn't have the amnio either and here's a picture of our little girl who has spina bifida and m almost all those people <coughs> sent pictures so they could say and we made the right decision and we love them just the same. But when I had the little girl who didn't have spina bifida and didn't have Down syndrome and didn't have anything except a wild head of black hair and some personality, that was really humbling. Mm -hmm. that, that really made me think, you know, and sometimes it goes so differently. Mm -hmm.